It has become increasingly trendy to hate on the first Avatar movie. It's just Pocahontas, they declare proudly, as if this is some kind of silver bullet that brings down the most successful movie of all time, evidently unaware that there are vastly more similarities between The Lion King and Hamlet, and yet no one ever complains about that. So I would like to begin this video by unpoisoning the well that is discussions about Avatar. I am not a lover nor am I a hater of the first Avatar movie. I do not think it deserves to be the highest grossing movie of all time, although I can definitely see how it managed to achieve that feat. And I also do not think it is some obscene disgrace to cinema. I think that the first Avatar movie is fine. It is quite good in some places, actually. And I think it's fair to say that Avatar is simultaneously the most overrated and the most underrated movie ever made. On the one team, we have the Happy Meal crowd, who like the flashing lights and value visual spectacle above all, and in that department, Avatar is, or at least was, an unprecedented masterpiece. And on the other side, we have the Brainlets, who can't get over the idea of something being called unobtainium. Yes, the plot is derivative. And yes, the MacGuffin may as well be called really hard to find -ium, but neither of these things actually make the film bad in and of themselves any more than changing Jake Sully's name to Cuthbert the Cheesebender. And meanwhile, I'm just kind of sat in the middle like, guys, come on, Avatar's like a 5 or a 6 out of 10, can we please stop with the hyperbole? So whilst I was absolutely blown away by Avatar 13 years ago when it came out, my opinion of it has waned significantly since then. With my take on the first movie now clarified, I will borrow slightly from Heath Ledger's Joker. When I say Avatar 2 is not very good, you know I'm telling the truth. So Avatar 2 Electric Boogaloo is an extremely silly movie that is way too long and relies on pretty weak characters to drive the plot. It is, however, sporadically entertaining. Let's get into some specifics, expect full spoilers for both the first and second Avatar movies. So Avatar 2 Avatar Harder reintroduces two characters from the first movie that were killed in that movie. Back in 2013, maybe, I think, I remember hearing that Stephen Lang and Sigourney Weaver were both going to be in 2 Avatar 2 Furious, and I was wondering how the hell they were going to do that. Both characters are very much dead, and yet both characters are very much in this movie. So the way they did this was sillier than I could have predicted. Let's start with Quaritch. So, I really like Quaritch. He is a very simple character, but he is extremely clearly defined. As a character in both Avatar and Avatar 2, he is one of the highlights for me. That said, his justification for being in this movie is laughable. So, Quaritch, along with a handful of other soldiers, appears in Dawn of the Planet of the Avatar 2 as an Avatar body with the consciousness and memories of the Quaritch from Avatar 1. Think memory implants from Blade Runner, that's basically what they've done here. Okay, the science in my fiction appears to line up. So, why did they do this? Well, this is where things stop making a lick of sense. If you recall, in Avatar 1, the Avatar project existed so that humans could traverse Pandora. Piloting artificially constructed Na'vi bodies meant that they could breed the Pandoran atmosphere and also interact with the Na'vi themselves in order to allow them to ostensibly peacefully obtain the unobtainium. The Avatar bodies are established to be of incredible value and are grown by combining the DNA of their pilots with DNA from the Na'vi themselves. The entire reason why Jake Sully is present on Pandora is because his twin brother, who was meant to be piloting the Avatar, was killed. These things are not disposable. They are a technological and biological marvel, and they are absurdly expensive. If you can simply make another one, then the premise of the first movie starts to spring multiple leaks. We are told that the Avatar bodies grew into maturity whilst in transit to Pandora from Earth, which took just over five years. Therefore, we can assume that it takes around five years for an Avatar to be grown, excluding any time required beforehand to tinker with DNA. Now then, back to Quaritch. So it turns out that the security force in the first movie had a backup plan in case they died. In the mother of all retcons, their memories were copied onto a hard drive so that they could be uploaded into an Avatar body, essentially meaning that they are resurrected clones in Na'vi bodies. I hate to say it, but this is almost on the level of somehow Palpatine returned. I have absolutely no idea why the humans would do this. This doesn't actually accomplish anything. If they can do this, why not do it into a human clone body? If they're able to do this, why not just make a hundred clones of Quaritch? Given the insane cost and complexity of Avatar bodies, why bother to use them as a backup for Rando Soldier number 17? If they can do this, why was Jake Sully even necessary in the first movie? This appears to indicate that Avatar bodies are no longer considered to be anything special and treats them as if people can just be copied and pasted into them for little to no reason. But if this is the case, why did they only do this with six of the deceased soldiers? Anyway, the movie does give us a couple of explanations as to why they did this, but neither of them really function. 
Firstly, Avatar bodies are much stronger and more durable than a human body, and they can also breathe the Pandoran atmosphere. However, this in and of itself is no reason to resurrect a bunch of people unless there is virtually zero cost in doing so, which is already established to not be the case. Oh no, all the soldiers on Pandora died. Ah, well luckily we can rebuild them as giant blue people who are really strong. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. This also introduces a potential character conflict for Quaritch, but not one that was explored whatsoever beyond a single line of dialogue. In the first Avatar, Quaritch was single-mindedly pro-human. He considered the Na'vi to be no more than savage apes. In Avatar 2, Quaritch is reborn in a Na'vi body. This does not cause him any kind of conflict. He still works directly to further the human's goal of taking over Pandora, even though he is not human. He never once considers the fact that he is now the thing that he hated, and this never causes any hint that his allegiances may shift. He is not a human piloting an avatar, he is a human consciousness trapped in an avatar. This makes me wonder what exactly his plan was. Get revenge by killing Jake and Neytiri, thus allowing the humans to take over, and then live happily ever after? Anyway, the second reason why Quaritch specifically is brought back is because the humans want to kill Jake Sully, as he has become the leader of the Na'vi after uniting the tribes at the end of the first movie, and killing him would presumably make their mission to take over Pandora much easier. The problem with this is that the whole make a backup of yourself in case you die thing happened during the events of the first movie, more than a decade before the humans would return to Pandora with the goal of killing Jake and taking over the planet. And there is no reason why you would want to put them in Avatar bodies at all, given that in Avatar 2 When Nature Calls, the humans have abundant access to extremely high-tech exoskeletal suits. I'm not talking about the mech walkers from the first movie, these new ones are much lighter and much more efficient. However, they appear to also be extremely strong and extremely effective, essentially allowing a human to scale up their body to the power level of a Na'vi. Their new mission also does not require stealth and or subterfuge. Killing Jake is a means to an end. Their ultimate goal is to take over the entire moon of Pandora, meaning that rather than spend however many billions of dollars resurrecting dead soldiers and plugging them into human-alien hybrids, you could just get new soldiers and give them these shiny new bionic exoskeletons. And if the entire reason for resurrecting Quaritch in an Avatar body was to kill Jake Sully, this seems to imply that there was no easier method of doing this. To put it another way, we are expected to believe that backing up the brains of soldiers in case they die, and then uploading them into human Na'vi hybrid bodies is not only possible but is also efficient, but using any kind of AI-driven killing machine such as a Terminator is not. But yeah, it sure is lucky that they had some protocol in place so that Jake's nemesis could return in the sequel. So, as depicted, the movie takes less time explaining how and why Quaritch is back and better than ever than I have just spent explaining it, and I feel like this was deliberate. Quaritch is a pretty cool character, and they wanted to just hand wave his return in order to have this character back in the movie. I am in two minds about this. On the one hand, there is a huge amount of nonsense required to have this character in the movie. On the other hand, once you get past the nonsense, he is one of the better parts of the movie, at least until we get to the ending. And that brings us to the other returning character. So, if you recall, Dr. Grace Augustine was killed halfway through Avatar 1. She was shot whilst escaping the human base, and she was not piloting her Avatar body at the time. The Na'vi attempted to transfer her consciousness into the Avatar using the magic god tree, but that didn't work. So, in Avatar 2, the second one, through the magic of performance capture, the 73-year-old Sigourney Weaver returns to play Kiri, who appears to be about 10. But Kiri is not a totally new character. Kiri was birthed from Grace's Avatar body. I'll try to be clear about this because, frankly, I found this to have some extremely weird and disturbing implications. We are told in a voiceover by Jake that Grace's Avatar became pregnant and they still have no idea how it happened. So, maybe I'm a pervert, but the only way this can happen is if at some point after the end of the first movie, some frisky Na'vi broke into the human's research facility and found Grace's avatar body floating there in a tank of goo and decided to dehymenate it. The subsequent child, born from this disturbing encounter between an alien of questionable moral integrity and a comatose immobile skin suit, was then adopted by Jake and Neytiri. Anyway, throughout the movie, it becomes clear that Kiri has some kind of abnormal connection with Ewa, which is the godlike consciousness of Pandora of which the Na'vi are a part. I think the implication is that Ewa somehow impregnated Grace's avatar, as there are of course some very obvious religious connotations to this, but this is not explained whatsoever in the movie, so I am only guessing that it will be revealed in Avatar 3, or 4, or 5. 
So anyway, the movie starts about a decade after the end of the first movie. Jake now has a family, and all seems to be well in the world. Then the humans suddenly come back for some more unobtainium. Except that, actually no, rather than keep things simple and have them want the same thing that we already know is the entire reason they came to Pandora to begin with, James Cameron has decided to complicate things this time round. Why have the humans returned? Well, in the first movie, they were there to mine the amusingly titled unobtainium, which is established to be very effective at generating power, and is therefore extremely valuable. In Avatar 2, the humans have returned because Earth is now in fact dying, and they need a new home. Luckily, the place they went to a decade ago to get a power-generating mineral is also an adequate home for them. Except for a few hiccups, notably the fact that they cannot breathe its atmosphere. Anyway, as with Quaritch himself, this is also an instance where we might have expected a degree of moral ambiguity, but this is not introduced at all. In Avatar 1, the humans were there to get unobtainium because it's really, really useful for generating power. We could argue that this was less of a selfish business venture and more of a necessity for the continued flourishing of humans on Earth, but either way, as depicted in Avatar, the actions taken by the humans were immoral and unjustifiable. They were the very clear villains of that story. In Avatar 2, The Search for More Money, the humans are back on Pandora because they need a new home because Earth is dying. In this movie, the humans do not have a choice. They are not here purely because they want to mine some cold hard cash. The consequences of losing are not that they simply waste a few trillion dollars. If they lose in 22 Avatar Street, then humanity may well go extinct. But this is never explored, and once again, the humans are just the evil anti-environmentalists. And, unrelated to this, the humans are apparently also there to harvest goo from the brains of space whales that we are told stops people aging. No, I did not make this up. This is a thing in the movie. There is a plot element whereby Quaritch wants to kill a space whale in order to draw out Jake, so he commandeers a human fishing vessel, and I had assumed that the fishing vessels were there to hunt space fish for meat, but apparently no. The whales have goo in their brains that stops people aging. I have absolutely no idea how the humans know this. I also have no idea why this is even in the movie, because they already had a justification for being there. I also have no idea why the humans have decided to go around killing the space whales rather than farming them given how valuable the immortal brain goo is. Unobtainium was, and presumably still is, a finite resource. Whale brain goo is only a finite resource if you hunt the whales to extinction. Presumably the reason the humans initially returned to Pandora was because Earth is dying, and then after arriving they somehow found out that the space whales have very useful brain goo? Anyway, I very much have a hard time believing that Jake or the Na'vi would allow the humans to get any kind of foothold on Pandora after what happened last time. I am not suggesting that they would be able to effectively stop the humans, but my point is that they didn't even seem to try. Rather than assemble any kind of army and re-evict those pesky humies for the second time, Jake just kind of lets them be there and grow in strength, virtually unhindered. Yes, we see him raid some of their transports and steal some equipment, but this is pretty much exactly what the Na'vi were doing at the start of Avatar 1 when Jake first arrived, which suggests that nothing has actually changed as a result of the first movie. Also, the humans in Avatar 2, the sequel, massively outgun the Na'vi. This was also true in Avatar 1, but due to the specifics of the plot in that movie, the Na'vi were able to win regardless. In Avatar 2, the situation is very much different. There is no reason why the humans don't just annihilate the entire planet. The only reason why this was not done in the first movie was because Quaritch needed intel on the location of the Unobtainium, and once they had that intel, it was full steam ahead, guns blazing, oorah, let's kill everything. Given that in Avatar 2 their goal is now to take over the planet and then repopulate it, they have no reason not to simply exterminate the Na'vi. Given the level of technology that the humans have access to, exemplified by the fact that the simple act of landing their spaceships at the beginning causes immense damage to the forest and the creatures within it, it is fundamentally unbelievable that the Na'vi could pose any kind of threat to the humans in Avatar 2. Anyway, Quaritch and his gang of replicant avatars are also here, and their quest is a singular one, to kill Jake Sully, the leader of the Na'vi. Quaritch and co. fly out to the forest to see what they can see, and, oh, wouldn't you know it, the children of the one specific guy you are trying to find and kill also just so happen to be at that location. From Quaritch's perspective, he has just gone into the Pandoran wilderness for the first time to do a bit of scouting, and within five minutes, the best possible thing that could have happened has just happened. He accidentally encountered the children of the guy he was there to kill. This, of course, leads to Jake being alerted to the return of Quaritch, and also allows for Spider to be captured, which kickstarts the plot. Okay, time for a quick diatribe about Spider. Amongst Jake and Neytiri's family is the human boy who calls himself Spider. 
The character of Spider is an extremely convenient way to accomplish a few things, and the plot would not function if this extremely specific sequence of events between films 1 and 2 had not played out in this particular way. Spider is essentially the keystone that prevents the entire movie from collapsing in on itself. So, Spider was born on Pandora, presumably during the events of Avatar 1, or potentially immediately afterwards. We are told that babies cannot be put into cryostasis, and that as a result he remained on Pandora and was raised by the scientists who also stayed behind, as well as by Jake and Neytiri. The movie conveniently avoids answering the question of why a human child in a gas mask was allowed into the Pandoran wilderness, given that every living thing that crawls, flies, or squats in the mud wants to kill it and eat its eyes for jujubes. As it turns out, Spider is Quaritch's son meaning that it sure is convenient that the one guy who ends up as the antagonist for this movie had a child off screen, and that that child was left on Pandora in order to drive the plot. The kid could have literally been anyone else's, but it just so happened to be Quaritch who squeezed one out in his spare time. Not only did someone have a child whilst away on a mission on a dangerous alien planet, but it also just so happened to be the guy who would need a translator and an emotional Achilles heel later in the movie. Anyway, Spider can speak both English and Na'vi, and so is forced to be a translator by Quaritch when he is abducted. His convenient capture at the start of the movie also acts as the inciting incident for the main plot, as this directly causes Jake and his family to leave their people and go and live with other people. A plan which can't possibly go wrong because it doesn't account for Quaritch locating him and killing those people instead. Anyway, jumping ahead momentarily, Spider also plays a pivotal role in the climax of the movie. As Neytiri threatens to kill Spider in front of his father in order to get Kira, her other adopted child, back from Quaritch. This results in Quaritch relenting and releasing Kira, which then results in Spider saving Quaritch from drowning. He appears to despise Quaritch, but decides to save him anyway, because Quaritch essentially saved his life and he felt that a debt was owed. My main issue with all of this from a character perspective is that Quaritch is an extremely driven and highly motivated character. Every single thing he does is with the goal of killing Jake. And yet, even though this Quaritch is not actually Spider's father, he refuses to let him be killed. The implication here is that as ruthless as Quaritch is, he still has some kind of natural inclination to protect his son, even though such an inclination is counterproductive given his mission. If this were the real Quaritch from the first movie, and it was his own infant son being threatened, I can believe that he would cave to a threat against the child's life. Given that this is a clone of the original Quaritch, and given that the child is in this case essentially the enemy, I find it quite difficult to accept that Quaritch would be any more protective of Spider's life than of any random Na'vi on Pandora. Apart from that one interaction, I don't really have a problem with this plotline because it is driven by the characters in a way that, for the most part, makes sense given what we know about them. Spider as a whole, however, feels very much out of place in this movie. Maybe it's because he's out of place in the world. He looks pretty ridiculous and he seems to exist because the plot says so. His shifting loyalty towards the Quaritch clone also was not developed, meaning that a lot of what he does is confusing at best. Anyway, as I mentioned, as a result of Spider being captured, Jake decides that he and his family must leave the Omatakaya people, with whom he has been living for over a decade after uniting the Na'vi as Torok Makto. His reason for doing this is that Spider knows a great deal about their whereabouts, and Jake believes that if he stays, his people will be killed. One problem with this is that Spider, of course, does not know that Jake has left, meaning that surely they will still be killed. And secondly, Jake is seen as a mythical hero who fulfilled some prophecy by uniting the disparate tribes to fight against a common enemy, the humans who were destroying their home. We are never given any reason as to why he doesn't just kinda do it again. The Jake Sully from the end of Avatar 1 would not have run away from a fight. Maybe having three children and adopting two more has turned him into a pussbag. Anyway, Jake and his family leave, and they head to the Sea People, called the Metkaina. We then get an incredibly drawn out second act, which feels like it takes around two hours. This entire portion of the movie drags and it did not need to. There are very clear scenes that could have been cut in their entirety. The short version is that one of Jake's sons fancies the daughter of the Sea People's chief, which causes tension between everyone. Jake and his family learn the ways of the sea people, including riding the various ocean-dwelling animals. And there are giant space whales that are kind of there too, one of whom befriends Jake's son. Okay, got all that? Good. We didn't need 120 minutes to tell it. We also learn that the Na'vi are now literally able to have a conversation with the space whales. This was never alluded to previously, but apparently it is now a thing. In Avatar, the concept was that the animals are exactly that animals, and if you plug yourself into one of them, you share thoughts and you have a degree of control over them. That's it. In Avatar 2 Cruise Control, characters literally swim up to the space whales and are like, hey Billy, how was your day? 
and the whale replies by making low rumbly noises that are helpfully subtitled, Oh man, today sucked. I got shot in the fin by a thingy. Can you remove it, please? Functionally, the reason why this happens is so that we have more sympathy for the space whales when they die than we would for the other animals. Unfortunately, in making the whales a particularly intelligent and special species amongst the Pandoran wildlife, they have somewhat detracted from the consistency of the interconnected biology of the setting. Anyway, eventually stuff starts to actually happen again when Quaritch arrives after having interrogated multiple other Sea People tribes and learned the location of Jake. He attacks some of the space whales to draw Jake out and also kidnaps his children for the second time. And it was at this point that I was asking myself, why is Quaritch doing what he is doing? From a character perspective, I can completely accept that this cloned version of Quaritch would want revenge on Jake and Neytiri after they killed him and defeated the humans in Avatar 1. What I mean to ask is why are the humans who are in charge of Quaritch still allowing him to dedicate substantial resources into killing one particular Na'vi? The original plan was to kill Jake because he is Toruk Makto, the one who united the clans. He was essentially the king of the blue people. Except that, after Spider got kidnapped, Jake forgot all that and decided actually no, I'm gonna give my crown to this rando and leave. Meaning that from that point onward, there was no reason for the humans to desperately want to kill Jake. And yet the entire plot is essentially a revenge plot, as it is driven almost entirely by Quaritch wanting to get revenge on Jake. Again, I have no issue with this from a character perspective, I have an issue with it from a logistical perspective. Upon learning that Quaritch has located him and is coming to kill him, he then warns the Sea People that they all need to abandon their homes if they want to survive as the humans will kill them all. This is precisely what happened in Avatar 1, but again, it does not seem in character for Jake unless he has regressed significantly off screen. Anyway, they ignore him and there is a big fight on the boat and the space whale comes to help, which was cool. And in amongst all this, there are about seven children who all get captured and held hostage at least once each, which really felt like the movie was wasting my time. During this climactic battle, the structure was essentially as follows. The bad guys have my kids, I gotta go rescue them. Oh cool, the space whale is helping. Oh cool, the kids escaped, let's go home. Oh wait, no, one of the kids got caught again, now we gotta go get them back. Alright, cool, we got them back, but oh wait, no, one of my kids got shot. Oh wait, okay, now we gotta go back to the capsizing ship for the third time because they still have one of my other kids. Yeah, as visually stunning as this whole sequence is, it definitely got a bit repetitive. There is a sequence where three of Jake's kids are handcuffed to a railing during the battle, and then they escape, and then immediately afterwards one of them gets caught again and gets handcuffed back on the railing, meaning that the stakes have not effectively changed and this sequence could have been cut down. Okay, time for a diatribe about the children. There are so goddamn many of them. Jake and Neytiri have five children, the king and queen of the sea people have three. There are eight children in this movie who are actual characters beyond bully number three. And I honestly think the movie would have been far better served to trim this way the hell down and give Jake two children. The one who falls in love and the one who dies heroically. Spider only exists as a plot device. Kiri's existence is a mystery that whilst may become relevant in future movies is absolutely not relevant in this one. And the fifth child, the youngest, doesn't actually do anything of her own accord and is literally used as a motivator for the other characters to fight over. Anyway, then Jake and Quaritch have their boss fight whilst Neytiri and child number 13 get stuck in the capsizing boat. Jake defeats Quaritch and chokes him out, leaving him to drown. Unfortunately though, Jake, Neytiri and their child are now stuck in the dark inside of a boat that is rapidly sinking. They are underwater and quickly running out of air. However, will they escape? Well, earlier in the movie they established that if you plug yourself into one of these fairy jellyfish things you can breathe underwater indefinitely. Cool, so uh, yeah, they don't do that. Anyway, it turns out Kiri can control the fish, so she makes them light up and swim inside the boat to show everyone the way out. Talk about a deus ex motherfucking machina. So, how did Kiri know where specifically they were? This I don't think can be answered, it's just tremendously goddamn lucky. How can Kiri control fish? This I am fully expecting to be answered in a subsequent movie, but therein lies the problem. This kinda reminded me of the ending of The Matrix Reloaded, where Neo zaps a load of sentinels whilst outside of The Matrix, which should not be possible. He suddenly appears to have this new ability that saved everyone's lives. The difference here is that the Matrix movies are about, amongst other things, Neo's incredible powers. He is both the protagonist of the movies and in-universe he is the one. He is literally the savior of humanity and he is the focus of those movies. In Avatar 2 The Quickening, Kiri exists for unexplained reasons and she can do impossible things for unexplained reasons. Even if you explain these reasons in Avatar 3, I do not find this to be a satisfying nor acceptable way to tell a story. 
The ending of Matrix Reloaded acted as a cliffhanger. Holy shit, how did Neo do that? Well, tune in next time to find out. The ending of Avatar 2 acts as a deus ex machina. Wait, how the hell can Kiri do that? And why does she even exist? Well, tune in next time to find out. Maybe Kiri is going to be revealed to be a Jesus-type figure in that she is the result of a virgin birth caused by Awa. Unfortunately, this is not in the movie, and in my view there is not nearly enough in Avatar 2 to adequately explain what she does at the end of the movie. To compare this to the ending of Avatar 1, they are similar in concept, but I feel the ending of Avatar 1 is much better in terms of execution. Before the big battle, Jake plugs himself into the spirit tree and prays to Awa to help them fight off the humans. During the battle, the animals of Pandora join in, and collectively they defeat the humans. Neytiri believes this to be as a result of Jake asking for Awa's assistance. So, you can definitely describe this as a deus ex machina moment, but there are a couple of ways around this. Probably the best explanation is that part of the concept of the movie is that Pandora acts almost as one sentient being, meaning that the entity they call Awa decided to help, rather than that all of the animals suddenly decided to fight back against the humans. This is still pretty fantastic in terms of timing, and it also suggests that the entirety of Pandora is a singular consciousness that is capable of making decisions, which somewhat dilutes the tension when we realize that the planet can just jump in and help the heroes because they asked nicely. However, what happens at the end of Avatar 2 is that Kiri directly controls the fish and made them go and rescue Jake and Neytiri. If Kiri is literally a physical manifestation of the will of Awa, then this means that the heroes are rescued because the planet decided to help them, which is precisely what happened in the first movie. If Kiri is some kind of super-powered Na'vi but is not directly linked to Awa, then this means that suddenly this character has magic powers that are necessary to rescue the heroes from a sinking ship. Either way, it is not a particularly satisfying ending. So, having outlined the plot, I want to briefly comment on Neytiri in this movie. She is basically not even there. Yes, she is present, but she doesn't really do anything other than whatever the family as a whole is doing. Jake argues with her in a couple of scenes, she gets angry, she cries, she occasionally flies around making Taliban noises. <laughs> but she doesn't really have any kind of impact on the plot. That is, until she gets her moment at the end in the hostage scene. So Quaritch is threatening to kill Kiri and tells Jake that he will let her go if he gives himself up. Before Jake can decide what to do, Neytiri appears and holds a knife to Spider's throat. Neytiri has already been established to not particularly like Spider, seeing him as an outsider who belongs with his own people. I assume that this is as a result of Spider being Quaritch's son rather than because he is human, because she had no such issue with Jake in the first movie. Anyway, not only does she threaten to kill her own adoptive son in this scene, but she also slices across his chest with her knife to indicate that she is very willing to follow through on her threat. Because we didn't really have much Neytiri time in Avatar 2 The Streets, the motivation here in terms of character development is definitely thinner than it otherwise could have been. Neytiri at this point has just lost one of her sons, and she sees killing Spider as being a fair trade. A son for a son. The problem with this is that Spider has no emotional bond with this Quaritch, and Neytiri has absolutely no reason to believe that he does. Yes, she is emotionally distraught in this scene, but unless we just hand wave this as, she's a bit nuts, this scene does not work as I think it was supposed to. The outcome is that Quaritch ends up relenting and releases Kira to be with her family. Quaritch is therefore unwilling to let Spider die, even if that means he will fail his mission to kill Jake. As I mentioned before, I do not believe that Quaritch would do this, but I will continue. So the way I would go about fixing this scene is to properly develop Neytiri's intense dislike of Spider throughout the movie. The problem is that, given that Spider is abducted right at the start, this is not possible without a rewrite. All we get is a voiceover line from Jake at the start where he mentions that Neytiri sees Spider as an outsider, and then we get her understandably intense emotional reaction to her son dying. We simply have to accept that these two puzzle pieces are enough to make the Neytiri we know from the first movie be willing to murder a child, which I do not think is sufficient. There are also no consequences for her doing this, even though she did so in front of both Jake and Kiri, although I think we can reasonably expect there to be some consequences in the next movie, as this event did take place right at the end of Avatar 2. To elaborate further on the whole climactic hostage situation, Quaritch has the memories of having a son, but this is not explored. The Quaritch in Avatar 2 knows that he does not actually have a son, and he knows that he is a clone and a copy of the original. His rational mind tells him that Spider is nothing to him, however his actions at the end indicate that, presumably, he has some kind of subconscious protective instinct for Spider in the same way that the original Quaritch would have, as this Quaritch is a copy and paste of the original. I am having to assume a lot here because this is simply not in the movie. Meaning that we do not understand why Neytiri is willing to kill Spider, 
and we do not understand why Quaritch gives in and stops her. And this is probably the most important moment in the movie. All right, so that's the end of the plot. Now it's time to talk about willies. One low-hanging fruit that the Avatar haters seem to enjoy regurgitating is something along the lines of ho ho ho, they stick their dicks in animals, ho ho ho. This is something I defended in the first movie because this isn't literally what is shown to happen. In Avatar 1, the Na'vi connect with the various creatures of Pandora and seem to be able to control them. Then, during the scene where Jake and Neytiri get jiggy, they plug their organs into each other. This suggests that the same organ that is used for sex is also used for plugging into animals to ride them into battle. This is definitely a bit weird, but because we don't know exactly what happens when they plug into each other, I am willing to accept that plugging themselves together is more to allow them to experience each other's thoughts and emotions rather than, say, her der he put his willy in a dragon. Given that Avatar 2 Money Never Sleeps confirms that the Na'vi procreate in a way that very closely resembles humans, I think it is perfectly reasonable to assume that they have genitalia very similar to ours. We see pregnant Na'vi, indicating that babies grow inside the female for a period of time before they are born. We also know that they don't, for example, lay hundreds of eggs and let the babies fight amongst themselves until only the strongest survives. Their method of pairing a male and female and raising a family also seems to be virtually identical to how humans do it. Which leads me neatly into something that I didn't think Avatar 2 would make me ask. Why is Jake fertile? As in, why did the scientists who grew the Avatar bodies bother to make it fertile? What possible benefit could there be to doing this? As this is of course not explained, nor what I expect it to be, the only assumption I can make is that the process of growing an avatar body involves fertilizing an egg of some kind, and then hitting go, leading to the accelerated growth of an otherwise normal Navi-human hybrid, which would presumably have functional junk. As for why the artificially grown avatar body has functional sperm, or I guess space sperm, that can effectively fertilize a Navi egg? I have no idea if it even works that way at all. The movie does actually play into this a little bit, as Jake and Neytiri's biological children are shunned for having too many fingers as a result of Jake's human DNA, but this is little more than lip service. Maybe I'm thinking about this too hard, or maybe I just like talking about reproductive organs, but I find it very strange that an artificially grown hybrid of a human and alien species that was grown for the purpose of exploring an alien planet is able to functionally impregnate one of those aliens. Okay, so summary time. Where Avatar 1 was Pocahontas or Dances with Wolves or The Last Samurai, but in space, Avatar 2 is Avatar 1, but again. As I already said though, I don't consider the plot in Avatar 1 being derivative to inherently be a problem. It is quite clearly using a traditional story with very familiar beats to explore a new setting and characters, and frankly, I don't care if the hero man falls in love with the native girl and fights his own people. I don't care if I have seen that before. With Avatar 2 full throttle, though, the similarities start to become problematic because the similarities are with its own predecessor and the similarities are in-universe. The humans invade Pandora. They severely disrupt the natural order by carelessly destroying the Pandoran wildlife. Jake leaves his people and has to integrate into a new society. There is a forbidden romance between the two cultures. The humans destroy something sacred to the natives for the purpose of acquiring an extremely valuable resource, prompting the Na'vi to attack the humans. One particularly notorious Pandoran creature aids them in the final battle. All hope seems lost, then the animals of Pandora and or Awa save the day. James Cameron has said that he does not think Avatar 2 is predictable, but unfortunately I have to disagree. The only major difference here is the ending. In Avatar 1, the humans are soundly defeated and exiled from Pandora. In Avatar 2, the bad guy is still alive, and the humans still have a substantial foothold on the moon, quite clearly because there are three more of these films still to come. I am, of course, being a bit reductive with this simplistic plot overview, but the key story beats are there, and they are virtually identical. And in some cases, these key story beats utilize exactly the same musical score as they did in the first movie. The characters and motivations have changed, but the story is essentially the same. And then finally, the movie ends with Jake and his family staying with the Sea People with the intention of continuing the fight against the humans, which makes me further question why this didn't happen at the start of the movie, but anyway. So after all that, how would I fix Avatar 2? Well, the groundwork is pretty much all there. After the events of the first movie, have the humans return. Instead of changing the reasons why they are interested in Pandora, keep it the same as the first movie. Unobtainium is absurdly valuable to them as a species, and they are not going to give up after one attempt. It pains me to say this, but get rid of Quaritch. As entertaining as he is, the method by which he comes back is nonsense. This would also mean we can get rid of Spider, which removes a big chunk of time from the movie. If you like, we can even replace Quaritch with Macho Military Man 2.0, and not much of the movie would change at all in terms of narrative progression. 
Maybe Quaritch has an identical twin brother who is even bigger and badder. The other major thing I would change is something I may change my mind on because it seems to be entirely set up for further Avatar sequels, but the Kiri character needs to go or needs to be changed. Maybe have Avatar 2 end with them discovering that Grace's Avatar is pregnant somehow, and give us that cliffhanger into Avatar 3. Yes, this would mean that the movie ends with the suggestion that someone raped a corpse, but it would also mean that the movie has more time to dedicate to Jake's other children. By removing Kiri and Spider, and we can also remove Tuck because Tuck doesn't do anything, this means that the two remaining children are Jake and Nitiri's two sons. The conflict between them and the rest of the family I think is pretty solid, but needed more time to develop. I also can't actually remember either of their names, and I didn't particularly care when one of them died. Although I like the overall arc of these characters, it definitely suffered from not being as fleshed out as it could have been. So most of this comes down to cutting things rather than fundamentally changing things. There is potentially a good two-hour movie in this three-hour movie. Elements of Avatar 2 are still salvageable. Unfortunately though, substantial portions are either extremely silly or irritatingly slow and meandering. Maybe this will be recontextualized with Avatar 3. If Avatar 3 makes full use of all of these seemingly superfluous characters introduced in Avatar 2, then maybe Avatar 2 will improve in hindsight. So, overall my take on Avatar 2 The Island of Lost Dreams is that it is not as good as the first one. Technologically, visually, the movie is outstanding. It is among the best looking movies out there and I would recommend seeing it in the cinema if you plan to see it at all. Although this video has focused largely on problems, there is still a lot to like in Avatar 2 and I did enjoy watching it for the most part. As stated, the visuals are phenomenal. The design of the creatures and the world, as in Avatar 1, are fantastic, and I particularly like the whole interconnected biology of the planet and the creatures. Pandora as a fantasy location is clearly very well thought out and developed in terms of concept and as such is very believable. There isn't much in the way of comedy in the movie, but I found quite a lot of the movie amusing due to its silliness. One thing I have not mentioned yet is the design of some of the human technology, in particular the crab robots that are like crabs, because I guess crabs are vaguely sea related, so I mean they gotta look like crabs. I'm very curious to see how successful Avatar 2 actually is. It's the sequel to the most successful movie ever made, and it has come seven years later than it was originally intended to. Given that as of writing this the film has just broken a billion dollars, this should suggest that people do actually still care about this franchise. I am one of those people. In spite of Avatar previously being James Cameron's worst movie, and in spite of the fact that Avatar 2 is now James Cameron's worst movie, I am still tentatively looking forward to Avatar 3. I am hopeful that Avatar 2 was a bit of a hiccup and that James Cameron will rein himself in a bit and actually trim some of the scenes down into a more streamlined movie. He has stated previously that because he made Titanic he can now do essentially whatever he wants with the Avatar movies. He has earned the right to create a movie that is exactly what he wants it to be, both in his own mind and in the eyes of the various companies that funded the movie. For better or worse, I think Avatar 2 is exactly the movie Cameron wanted to give us, which is evident from his claim that there will be no director's cut. Probably the biggest compliment I can give Avatar 2 though is that even though it is deeply flawed, it is probably better than 75% of the movies I have seen this year. It doesn't do anything new, and it has substantially more problems than its predecessor, but overall, despite some serious issues, I found myself sporadically entertained. Okay, so thank you again guys for watching. I wanted to take a bit of a break from working on the final autopsy for Rings of Power, and after watching Avatar 2 over Christmas, I found that surprisingly, I had a fair bit I wanted to say about it. Don't worry, the final Rings of Power video is still coming, but it has ended up being a lot longer than I had anticipated. In the meantime, thank you for your continued support. If you do like this shorter video format for like initial thoughts on movies, then please let me know. It is a lot less work than the longer analysis videos, so I kind of figured it can act as a bonus for those of you patiently waiting for my Rings of Power autopsy. Anyway, subscribe, like, share, yada yada, and I will see you in my next video.